number 20-0020, um, State of Arizona versus Perez Aguida. Um, and we have Joshua Smith, I believe, from the Attorney General's office representing the state. That's correct, Your Honor. And we have Scott Bonikowski from the Public Defender's Office. Is that also correct? That's correct, Your Honor. All right, thank you. And thank you for appearing um, in our virtual world here. Um, I, before we begin, I would remind counsel that um, we have reviewed the briefs. We've discussed this case in conference here this morning. And uh, we are familiar with the record. I just keep that in mind when you're giving your argument. Uh, when you begin your argument, would would you please state your name again, just uh, for our record? This is being recorded. And um, counsel, uh, Mr. Bonikowski, the if you wish to re reserve any time, it's uh, it's incumbent upon you to to manage that. All right. Thank you. Um, and. With that, we will begin. All right. May it please the court, my name is Scott Bonkowski and I represent the appellant, Mr. Byron Perez Agueda. Um, I'd like to reserve five minutes of my time for a rebuttal. Uh, today's case presents this court with a peculiar set of facts and circumstances that warrant relief solely as to count five in this case for two reasons. First, based on the circumstances in this case, this court should recognize that a separate act instruction was necessary uh, to correct a risk, an undue risk of multiplicitous convictions in this case. And two, that contributing to the delinquency of a minor is a lesser offense of sex conduct with a minor under 15. And that based on the unique facts of this case, that instruction, which Mr. Byron Perez Agueda requested as to count five, uh, was warranted. So I'd like to begin by discussing uh, the first claim that a separate act instruction um, is necessary to, under certain circumstances, correct um, an undue risk of multiplicitous convictions. And I want to emphasize just the number, uh, the significant number of, of circumstances that uh, must obtain to make this claim um, viable and meritorious. Um, so first, what before you before you do that, and, and just so we're the records clear and in our discussion. Um, the defendant did not request a separate acts instruction um, when settling jury instructions in this case, correct? No, and for that reason, this case, this uh, claim would be reviewed for fundamental error. Um, but the jury asked a very specific question uh, during deliberations, and that question was the focal point of the separate acts uh, determination. You agree with me on that? Uh, the question, I think, is what raised this, should have raised this concern, uh, both for the trial court and, and for defense counsel. It appears that the, the jury was confused as to whether count five and count six in this case um, were concerning uh, separate acts or separate events, I think is how they phrased it, or the same um, event. And that question came after the state presented its argument and after the jury had already been instructed on uh, separate counts instruction. Um, counsel, so, did, did trial counsel ob object or sub well, the way I understand the record, the state suggested that the trial court give an answer that would incorporate a separate acts uh, instruction? No, the state um, suggested that the jury be reread the separate count instruction. Um, that, that's, and not, that's not the first thing the state said, though. The state's initial out of the, when they came up to the bench, the state said, well, judge, these are separate acts. I mean, that, and the question was, are they separate acts? And the state said, Yes, Judge, they are separate acts. And then they went on to discuss, well, what should we do? And settled on giving the separate counts instruction again. But wasn't that the state's first inclination? Was to tell the jury that they were separate acts? Yes, that does appear to have been the state's first uh, inclination. But after um, discussing did, with the trial court. Did the defense 
agree? Did the defense say, yeah, we agree, you should tell them that? The defense appears to have acquiesced in the suggestion that the separate count instruction be reread. Um, and the essentially all defense counsel said uh, at the end of this discussion between the trial trial court and the state was um, that's fine with me, I believe is uh, what the record reads. Um, so, yes, the, it, this was the opportunity for the defense to uh, just a separate act instruction, yet um, that didn't occur. And for that reason, this this claim is reviewed for fundamental error. But Mr. Prezeguet acknowledges that in his briefing and 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 upfront um, indicated that that would be the standard of review. So again, but what ultimately would warrant a separate act instruction distinct from a separate count instruction is seven circumstances really that that had to have ob obtained. So first, we had two counts that um, charged the same statutory offense. Um, we have uh, those counts alleging the same date range. We have those counts that include factual allegations, but the factual allegations do not sufficiently distinguish any act underlying each count as separate and distinct. And that's based on the way that the allegations are, are phrased. Um, so what we have here, for example, is count five alleges uh, the first time when victim B was 14 and count six alleges the time that vic um, resulted in victim B's pregnancy when she was 14. Now, those could des describe separate acts, but not necessarily. Indeed, the first time may very well be the time that resulted in pregnancy. And so for that reason, they don't sufficiently distinguish the, the underlying act for each count. And that's distinct from what we typically would see in uh, the way a sex case is charged, which typically describes the act based on location. So for that reason, you know, that would sufficiently distinguish underlying acts because the same act can't be committed in two places at the same time. Um, so in addition to the factual allegations, the other instructions in the case didn't adequately inform the jury of the principle that's at issue here, that they can't base multiple counts on the same act, or alternatively, that each count must, must be based on a separate and distinct act. The separate counts instruction failed to do that. And the state argues, however, that, that it was sufficient. But really, if we look at that instruction, particularly if we look at it as a whole, it fails to do that. It does have some superficial appeal in the sense that it includes the words separate and distinct, but it doesn't include the word act at all, which is truly the object of the principle that the jury needed to be aware of and that should have been, you know, was triggered by its, its confusion as to those counts. Um, so we know that from uh, the historical purpose of this separate count instruction is really just to tell the jury like what their duties are with respect to each count. Each count doesn't stand and fall with whether you know they find the defendant guilty on another count. Each one's essentially independent. They've got to look at them independently. They can find the defendant guilty of one count, not guilty of another count. That's all the instruction does. But it doesn't inform them of the principle that it must factually base each count on a separate and distinct act. Then um, moving well, what's on. The, what's the difference to a, a lay juror when they read the first sentence that says, each count charges a separate and distinct offense. I mean, we, you know, we're in the weeds, and so we understand that offense and act may have, you know, different meanings legally. But when a juror is reading that, um, why isn't that enough to trigger them to understand that? Oh, they're separate. They're separate offenses. They're different offenses. Um, and, and and kind of as a piggyback to that. Does the fact that a jury asks a question that's readily either is readily available in the instructions to begin with, is that some sort of message to us that the whole jury doesn't understand? One jury wants some clarification. You know, one juror is refusing to read the instructions. And so the jury has to come to the judge and say, can you just tell this juror? Can you point him back to the instructions? We're not having any luck. Is that really what determines whether the, you know, whether something like this should be reversed? So the the question itself is really more geared, more an indication of, of the problem itself. It's an indication of the problem itself uh, and the confusion that, that, you know, was resulting from the way that these counts, the factual allegations in these counts were structured. And the trial court seemed to recognize that at the beginning of the discussion after the question. But I can't personally, to answer the latter part of your question, speculate as to whether this was just one juror who was confused and not reading instructions or whether it was the whole. I think that my 
I think that the strongest indication would be that the jury as a whole, because they brought the question to the judge and they weren't able to obviously work it out themselves. Um, nevertheless, um, to answer the, I believe the first part of your question, um, the um, looking at the first sentence of the instruction um, in isolation, I still don't think adequately conveys the relevant principle to the jury. And that's because the, the, the offenses or the crimes are um, separate and distinct. But what's not clear is on what basis, right? We know as legal professionals, you know, that counts are separate on the basis of, of different acts. But the jury doesn't know that. They could very well believe that, you know, these there's two, the same act is being charged twice based on the, the bad features of it, you know, because count five, for example, it's bad because it was the first time. Count six, it's bad because it was the time that resulted in pregnancy. So it's being charged twice for those reasons. The instruction doesn't say that, no, it's being charged uh, on the basis of separate and distinct acts that occurred. And indeed, you must find that separate and distinct acts occurred to convict the defendant of both. So for that reason, uh, the instruction is adequate. And if again, if you look at it as a whole, it, it's really more, you know, getting back to its historical purpose, right, and in, informing the jury simply of its right, its duties as to each count. Got to look at the evidence to each count, make a determination of guilt as to each count. The counts don't stand and fall together. If you find the defendant guilty of count five, he's guilty of all the other counts. You look the at count, each count The counsel, the, the state in its closing argument went on for a long time discussing the evidence and saying these are two separate acts. So, the, so why, we look at not only the instruction, but the arguments of counsel to determine um, whether or not there was error, don't we? Um, we do, but the argument of counsel was also regarding the evidence. The state was arguing that the evidence uh, supported, you know, two acts. The but the arguments of counsel, the jury's instructed also are, are not the evidence itself. So the jury could still find, even despite the state's argument, only one act occurred, um, despite the state arguing two acts. But nevertheless, the jury was still confused after that argument. So the argument itself to say was sufficient to apprise the jury of this principle, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work because the jury's confusion still maintained after that argument. Um, and at that point, that's when an instruction should have been given that that ultimately solved that confusion. But I, I think also, I mean, further argument could have been an alternative, um, as the state was initially suggesting, could have been a way to um, alleviate the the undue and impermissible risk um, that Mr. Prezegueta was facing um, as a result of the question, uh, and as a result of the way the counts were were alleged uh, and structured. Um, and again, also as a result of the evidence that actually was adduced at trial, which included the fact that Mr. Prezegueta testified consistent with his earlier interview statements, that there was only one act when victim B was 14. And it was that one act that was both the first time and the time that resulted in um, her becoming pregnant. So the jury could very well have accepted that um, testimony. And I believe that based on the verdicts rendered, that's the most likely scenario um, because the way that the, the verdicts rendered um, play out, it, I don't think that there's a, a strong inference that the jury um, you know, would have necessarily found two acts. Um, now, moving on to Mr. Prezegueta's uh, second claim that contributory delinquency is a lesser uh, included offense of sex conduct with a minor under 15. This claim, uh, I'd like to first just address the state's notice of supplemental authority. Um, each and every single, every one of the cases that the state has cited in its notice is materially distinguishable. And they're all distinguishable on the basis that they define contributory delinquency differently than how Arizona defines it. So if the, you know, analysis is an analysis of the elements to reach a particular result, the results from these other states um, really have no persuasive value here if the elements that they're examining are different than the elements in Arizona. And ultimately that gets to the crux of this issue is that Arizona idiosyncratically defines uh, delinquency. These other states and the, in the other cases that the state cite largely by and large uh, 
define delinquency as we understand it, um, which is an adjudication of, of, of juvenile guilt for the commission of a crime. That's not how Arizona does it, though. The Arizona legislature has broadly defined delinquency as uh, injuring or debasing the morals, health, and welfare of a child. And it's based on that broad definition that um, is what leads to the result that contributory delinquency is a lesser of uh, both molestation and sex conduct with a minor. So um, if we do, you know, ultimately this claim um, is the result of contributory delinquency being a lesser of molestation and molestation being a lesser of sex conduct with a minor under 15. Um, now, Sutton holds that uh, contributory delinquency is a lesser of molestation. The state disputes whether Sutton is still good law. At an absolute minimum, Sutton's holding that um, an act of sexual contact um, necessarily as a matter of law um, results in delinquency, in other words, an injury to the minor's morals, health, or welfare, is still good law. And that kind of an analysis is um, that certain, I see that I'm out of time for uh, the first 15 minutes of this argument. Um, so I will um, hand it over to the state at this point and resume in um, my reserve time. Thank All right, you. thank you, counsel. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. May it please the court, my name is Joshua Smith, Assistant Attorney General representing the state of Arizona. Uh, we're asking that this court affirm Aguada's <laughs> convictions and uh, sentences. First, uh, the trial court did not err when it did not give a separate act instruction uh, when no, none of the parties requested it and no Arizona legal authority would require it to be given. And second, uh, contributing to the delinquency of a minor is a lesser related offense of sexual conduct with a minor, not a lesser included offense. And as such, the trial court did not abuse its discretion when denied Aguada's requested lesser included jury instruction. Mr. Smith, I'd like you to focus, if you could, <clears throat> on the, um, the question and the answer that happened during deliberations. Um, the question from the jury requested to, to know whether or not there was a separate act, if they needed separate acts. You would agree with me on that? Uh, the juror's question was calls for a yes or no. I, it's I'm not exactly a yes or no question. I, I view it more as a factual question where the jury was asking if they were, if they were separate acts. So uh, to that extent, yes, uh, they're asking if they're separate acts. Okay. So if, if the jury needs to know or thinks they need to know whether or not these need to be separate acts, and the state says, yeah, tell them it needs to be separate acts, and the court doesn't do that. The court refers them back to an instruction that doesn't tell them that. So isn't the error in failing to instruct is is more just failing to answer the question asked by the, a jury, a le legitimate question asked by a jury? Well, the state's uh, initial question or initial response was more answering the factual question posed by the jury of, yes, these are separate acts, uh, but there was never a suggestion that the state give a provide the state that the court give a separate act instruction. Agueda never suggested a separate act instruction be given, um, and no one suggested the trial court answer the factual question of the jury of are these separate acts. Um, so the the issue is did the trial court err when it did not sua sponte craft this instruction where no one's requesting it? There's no legal authority provided to the judge that this instruction is appropriate and there's no legal authority holding that the instruction is required under these circumstances. But I think what he's asking is it's not if we're thinking about a formal instruction. No, nobody asked that. But what if the judge had just written back and said, yes, yes, it does. No formal, you know, out some other states separate act instruction, but just an honest answer to the question, which both parties agreed was the case. Does this require separate acts? And the judge scribbles down the word yes. Parties well, well, that separate acts are are what are being alleged in counts five and six. 
Well, the jury's question wasn't was, was essentially asking, are are these two separate acts or are they the same act? And I think the court would answer yes, they're separate acts. Then that would that could that would be problematic because that's the court essentially telling the jury a factual issue, and it becomes it's a it's. Given given the uh, part the position of the parties and the defense, it's it's really a factual dispute about. But it's not a problem if the judge gives the jury uh, an answer that both parties stipulate to, then no one can object to that. I mean, both parties agreed that these were separate acts, that they were charged as separate acts, that the state spent considerable time arguing they were s separate acts, that the state initially told the judge yes, tell them yes, it was a separate act. So how is that? How would that be a problem for the court to answer the question honestly when both parties agreed that was the case? I, well, I don't recall that Agueda agreed to the state's suggestion that tell the jury that yes, these are separate acts. Agueda did agree to the court referring the jury back to the separate counts instruction. Um, so I, I don't I don't recall which doesn't that. answer. See, that's what I keep coming back to is. Referring them back to a separate counts instruction doesn't answer their question. Well, I, I think under the totality of the circumstances here, the instructions uh, and the, the verdict forms and everything was was sufficient to cue the jury in that these are separate acts involved. Uh, the 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 counts allege specific specific uh, uh, conduct that are different, distinct from each other. And I think. Combined with the state's argument is sufficient. The court referred the jury back to you know the evidence. But, um, but Mr. Smith, look, the if there had not been that jury question, if you simply had the argument of counsel and you had the verdict forms as they were written and the instructions, and the jurors come back guilty on both charges, there's not an issue on that kind of claim because we would defer to what's going on. But the jurors come back specifically and ask, do these have to be separate acts or something to that effect? And the judge doesn't answer the question. Yes, but nothing else from the record indicates the jury remained confused following the Other question. than the impasse instruction that needs to be given after that? But we don't know what they were impasse. We don't know what they were deadlocked on. It's well, you said there was nothing else in the record, and that's not really correct. There was well, something yes, else but 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 the indication that they're deadlocked, Judge, we that it's assumption and speculation that they were deadlocked on these two counts. We don't know what two counts they were deadlocked in. There's nothing to indicate that they're deadlocked on these two counts specifically. We assume that they may have been deadlocked on those two counts, but nothing affirmatively from the record shows that the jury remained confused about whether separate acts were charged or whether they had to find separate acts for counts five and six after the court answered their question. Uh, and in order to show prejudice under fundamental error, it has to be more than speculation. And ultimately, the art, the prejudice argument is is based upon the speculation that the jury could have maybe thought that these were the same acts, but still convicted them anyways. Uh, and the and the only evidence to, that they can uh, that Aguada can point to to try to argue that the jury remained confused is the deadlock instruction. But as I noted, there's nothing affirmatively from the record that shows that they were deadlocked on those two counts. Um, Given given the state's closing argument, which repeatedly emphasized that counts five and six involved separate acts, Agueda never argued to the jury that counts five and six were separate acts. His arguments to the jury focused entirely on the credibility of the younger sister, uh, victim A. Um, given the arguments of counsel, given uh, the, the, the verdict forms specify different conduct, and given that... Uh, you know, the jury didn't, there's nothing affirmatively from the record showing the jury remained confused about whether five and six dealt with separate acts or the same act. Uh, Guida fails to carry his burden under fundamental error uh, that the trial court erred in not giving this separate act instruction. Um, well, because That raises an interesting issue for me as well. And that's the notion that when it comes to um, a double jeopardy issue, which is what he's arguing, the case law says that we review that de novo. How do we re review this issue de novo? Well, I, th I, uh, I think that it, it, the double jeopardy issue is a little distinct from the uh, instruction issue. Uh, the double jeopardy issue is more, is the indictment multiplicitous? And on its face, the indictment's not multiplicitous. 
And the only way I think you can conclude the indictment is multiplicitous is by solely crediting Aguada's testimony and completely discounting the victim's testimony. The victim testified there were multiple sex acts uh, when they were when she was 14. Aguada said there was only one sex act, but that's really a, a factual dispute. The indictment on its face uh, uh, specifies different conduct in counts five and six. So I think looking at de novo, the indictment on its face isn't multiplicitous. And to the extent that the evidence that trial could suggest it was multiplicitous, that's ultimately a factual dispute. And as, as far as I know, there's no legal authority that says this court is required even under de novo review to solely credit Aguada's testimony. Uh, and so um, I, I think the, the multiplicity issue is a little, is, is separate. Isn't it in a de, novo, a de novo review, we would accept the facts that we believe were determined by the jury, which harkens back to the idea, did the jurors actually resolve this factual dispute between the victim and the defendant when they specifically asked a question that was not answered? Uh, yes, you would, you would normally uh, defer or uh, rely on the, the factual findings. And I would, I would again, judge, just go back to nothing from the record affirmably shows the jury remained confused about whether there were separate acts following the court's instructions. Uh, the instructions as a whole combined with the arguments of counsel were sufficient to inform the jury that they had to find separate acts for counts five and six and that counts five and six involved separate acts. Uh, so given the totality of the record, the state's position is uh, Aguada fails to carry his burden uh, to establish error, because even, even under de novo review, Aguada has the affirmative duty of proving that there was error, and he, uh, the state's position is he doesn't even prove error. And even, so under fundamental error review, uh, that would be the end of the analysis. Um, and even under de novo review, that would be the end of the analysis. But ultimately, uh, I, the state doesn't believe that the trial court erred in not giving an instruction when no legal authority compels the court to give the instruction. Uh, it's not included in the standard jury instructions in the Rajis. None of the parties suggested it would, that a, a specific instruction that the jury had to find separate acts would be necessary, though the state did indicate that, yes, factually, counts five and six involve separate acts. Um, so I think under the totality of the circumstances here, Aguada fails to carry his burden of proving fundamental prejudicial error. And as a result, uh, he's not entitled to relief on the first claim. Do we need to reach that issue if we reverse on the on the second claim on the failure to give a lesser? I think you might need to reach the multiplicity issue, but again, because the multiplicity issue is fact dependent, um, you may not need to reach it if you were to find the trial court erred and not giving a lesser included instruction. But uh, Guida was not entitled to the lesser included instruction for contributing to delinquency of a minor because. Uh, contributing to the delinquency of a minor is not a lesser included offense under the elements test. Uh, Sutton did not employ an elements test. Sutton really just kind of employed a logical analysis of, well, um, molesting a child is going to harm the welfare and health of the child, and therefore it, it's a lesser included. But the molestation statute since Sutton has been changed. Um, so to the extent Sutton is good law, it doesn't really apply anymore because the statutes are different. Um, it also didn't follow, as I noted, the, uh, the elements test. The uh, Supreme Court uh, again affirmed in Carter uh, last year. And under the elements test, you, you, you have to look to see whether the, lesser, the greater offense contains an additional element to the lesser offense. And if you look at the elements of sexual conduct of the minor and contributing to the delinquency of a minor, they're not, it's, they're, they don't have the same elements. Sexual conduct with a minor is not contributing to the delinquency of a minor with an additional element added onto it. Um, the elements but are completely Aren't you different. missing a step there, Mr. Smith? It, isn't it, we start with uh, sexual conduct with a minor ha has a lesser of molestation, which then has a lesser of uh, contributing to the delinquency of a minor. That would be one way to do it. Um, and Again, the molestation statute is, is changed since Sutton was decided. So to the extent Sutton would still control, the, the statutes are different now. And I know that there is some uh, dispute amongst Arizona uh, courts of appeal decisions about uh, whether uh, molestation is a lesser included of sexual conduct with a minor. I think the Flores case decided that it was so long as you charged that it was sexual conduct with a minor younger than 15 um, in order to get the elements together. 
but the molestation statute um, today is different than the molestation statute under Sutton. So even, um, you know, even if, to the extent that Sutton is good law, it's still distinguishable because the lesser included molestation, the statute has changed. Um, and again, Sutton didn't apply an elements test for the molestation. So it's the same thing. When you look at the elements of molestation, it's not contributing to the delinquency of a minor with an additional element tacked on. It's kind of more of a logical conclusion that you can't molest a child without harming the welfare of the child. And I'm sorry, Your Honor, it sounded like you had a question. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't see video for the panel. I, I, no, continue. I don't have a specific question. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, so the state, the, the state's position then is contributing delinquency is not a lesser included of sexual conduct with a minor or molestation of a minor. It's a lesser related offense. Um, uh, as Sutton cited as in a footnote, State v. Harvey, which involved you know uh, a case where the defendant uh, photographed himself having sex with a daughter, and they did, the Arizona Supreme Court decided a double jeopardy issue, but that was more of a 13116, where they concluded that uh, the conduct is uh, the conduct that, that can give rise to sexual uh, or contributing delinquency can also give rise to the statutory rape. So it's not a lesser included offense, it's a lesser related offense where it can involve similar conduct and uh, uh, still have a uh, supported, but that doesn't make it a lesser included offense under the elements test that Carter announced. So because it's not a lesser included offense, but only a lesser related offense, the trial court did not abuse its discretion when denied Aguida's request for a lesser included offense instruction for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. So unless the panel has any further questions uh, regarding the issues, the state would ask that the court uh, affirm Aguida's convictions and sentences and deny the relief requested in uh, Aguida's uh, appellate briefs. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank Smith. You. Counsel? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, so just to jump off from where the state left off as to the second claim, the state argues that uh, Sutton's no longer good law because the molestation statutes changed. It doesn't identify how. The state cannot identify how it has materially changed that it would affect the analysis in Sutton. Now, but beyond that, it also argues that it didn't engage in an elements test. Uh, it made it as like a matter of logic. Or, um, but that's an analysis that courts in Arizona still apply in conducting the elements test. For example, um, as a matter of physics or as a matter of logic, an element of a greater offense can necessarily include, as a matter of law, uh, an element of a lesser. For example, in Miranda, the element of a reasonable apprehension of imminent physical harm by a uh, deadly weapon necessarily includes, as a matter of logic or as a matter of law, uh, disturbing one's peace. Um, same thing as a matter of physics, for example, in Ortega with the holding that molestation is a lesser of uh, sex conduct with a minor, um, the element of you know, penetration in, in sex conduct necessarily as a matter of law, as a matter of physics, includes the element of sexual contact or a touching of genitals. Um, so that sort of analysis is still good law in conducting um, the elements test. And indeed, the state cannot proffer a single scenario, logical scenario or otherwise, in which when a defendant uh, commits sex conduct with a minor under 15, he is not committed um, contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Um, every time that occurs, there's the elements of, of, of um, contributory delinquency have obtained. Um, and again, if we're gonna do the analysis, uh, elements test analysis, um, once again, it, both offenses contain a mens rea element. Um, molest, uh, molestation is uh, intentionally or knowing. Um, contributory delinquency is just a more broadly defined criminal mens rea, um, but that's okay. We know from, for example, Carter, right, where the greater offense can have a more specifically defined uh, element to the corresponding more broadly defined element of the lesser. Um, and uh, both have a no specified particular act. It's just some act that causes a particular result. Um, in, in sex or in molestation, that result is sexual um, contact. In contributory delinquency, that result is delinquency, which is um, the injury or debasement of a, a minor's morals, health, or welfare. Um, and so every time, and 
To the extent Sutton didn't perform an elements to test, it's distinguishable on that basis. To the extent that the statute has changed, the portion from Sutton concluding as a matter of law that um, an act of sexual contact um, is an act that debases the morals, health, or welfare of a minor is still good law. And then both offenses have this attendant circumstance of a child. Um, so for that reason, it passes the elements test. And it, counsel, it, in this case, um, but what was the evidence? What was the evidence distinguishing the lesser from the greater? And Judge Foster didn't give it because he said, "Well, you admitted to it, so there is no distinguishing element between these offenses." Judge Foster denied uh, the lesser on the basis of this doctrine of denial, um, and that was a. And the state has conceded this in briefing that that was incorrect. That just saying because Mr. Prezaguida denied count five, he can't get the lesser. That uh, doctrine is not as clear cut as that. Um, you still have to look at all the facts and circumstances. And here, those unique facts um, warranted the instruction, not just because as a matter of law, uh, contributory delinquency is a lesser of, of sex conduct, but the facts here were such that um, the instruction was warranted. The jury could find that if they believe Mr. Agueda, again, based on his credible and, and consistent testimony uh, at trial with his prior interview statements, one act occurred, he didn't have sex with her the, that first time and as to count five, but nevertheless, he was engaged in this romantic relationship, right? Which included kissing and hugging, which are the acts that we know from Hickson, a uh, very old case, that are sufficient um, uh, acts that uh, to um, uh, prove uh, contributory delinquency. And then coupling that with this grooming testimony, uh, and the fact that Mr. Prezagueta ultimately did have sex with her, that, that those that those romantic acts contributed to her delinquency because they were done with this expectation of eventually having this blossom into a sexual relationship. And that that ultimately, as as acts of grooming, were, were injuring her morals and health or welfare and essentially making her feel like she is a willing participant in these later acts. So in these later sex acts. So for that reason, um, the facts did support and warrant the instruction here. And these are unique facts in this case. All right. Thank you, counsel. Your time has expired. Thank you. Um, uh, we thank you for your briefing and your arguments here today. Uh, the, we will take the matter under advisement and issue a written decision in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.